so this is the uh polaroid time timeline for the uh polar vision and polar chrome so as i already said dots redwind land um developed polar vision the um super 8 cine system um and then spun that off to uh develop polychrome that was in 1977 there's a little timeline there that um puts this in context with the other um polaroid uh developments a lovely um photo of all of polaroids magic over the many years and um i found this this press clipping which is actually from six years after um it was first launched and um what's interesting in the new york times is that they are specifically referring to um the instant 35 millimeter there six years after the launch in terms of um you know perhaps this is uh although polar vision failed perhaps um the instant 35 millimeter uh is is a bit more of polaroid's future because that is the um the instant processor that's shown there um got a little image of um dr edwin land against steve jobs there because uh if you've if you've read any of the um sort of biographies of these two people they have been um compared and, and likened in a number of different ways um one in terms of how they um developed their their, their tenacity their um entrepreneurship um hard uh you know hard very hard taskmasters and the way that they did launches at their um uh <clears throat> when they gave the company results <clears throat> okay so what is it how does it work uh there were five 35 millimeter instant films um i'm showing polar chrome and polar graph there polygraph is a high contrast black and white as well as those there was a high contrast color um a a, a, a polar pan black and white um something called polar blue um and five all together built them in um so if you're if you're looking at i can't see myself on the screen at the moment but you bought it in a pack um with the the 35 millimeter film and as well as that there was a little pod of processing chemistry and that enabled you to to process the film in the special uh processor i've got the hand cranked one it came as a motorized one as well and having exposed the film conventionally in um the 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 color there is is iso 40 um the um polar graph in uh high contrast black and white is actually iso 400 um then you put the film and the processing pack into the processor and you wound it out with the processor closed so it was in the dark and what happened was that the um there was a, a long um strip inside the processor pack as well as a pod of chemistry you it broke the pod of chemistry it spread that chemistry all the way along the the film as you wound it and a leader um sandwiched onto the film and wound onto um a a roller inside of the the dark uh, container uh, you then waited a processing time which was of the order of two minutes or so and um i i when i processed a couple that i bought um they were ages old and i i did process them for you know a lot longer um you waited that time you then turned the handle again which wound the uh, film and uh wound the leader back into the the processing pod um and that just left the film inside the developed film inside the cassette you snapped open the cassette 
and um, there were your images. Um, and we'll see a little bit later when I show you some images, some of the um, problems of the aged film because it did work, uh, but not, um, you know, there were, there were issues with the film that I was using being so old. Um, okay, so uh, here is, here's an example image. Um, the, the, the whole print there is six inches, four inches, and there is a sectional enlargement where you can see the lines. So how did it work? This is additive color. Now, if we were, um, you know, talking many years ago and we were talking about color processes um, and, and films, um, we'd be, um, you know, thinking of, of additive color as the beginning of this uh, beginning of the um, century in 1900s and um, we'd be proudly boasting of um, our modern subtractive color processes um, well it's come full circle because you know the, the the all of the devices that we're using the screen you're looking at um, they're all additive color they all work by having um, red green and blue um, pixels that um, you you look at blending your eye to produce the colors. So I think it's quite interesting that, um, you know, we've gone full circle from um, additive color at the beginning of the 1900s um, through to all of the color processes, which were subtractive color through to all the, the digital processes that we view today, which are um, additive. Okay, so um, I went to Tate Modern in the summer of this year, and I saw a Mondrian exhibition, and um, this is one of the posters from the exhibition. Or is it? No, no, I'm just kidding. That's rubbish. Um, as many of you will know, um, that was um, three images of three different color additive color processes. And um, I've put quite a lot to talk about on this single slide. So I'm a scientist, so I'm interested in the sizes of things. And I've got some sort of marvelous concupokia of um, sizes on this um, little slide here. So I found this image in the center um, that compares um, Dufochrome, Dufocolor, um, the Polaroid process and um, Autochrome. And um, I've, I've made an estimate of what the pixel size is. So not the line ruling size. Um, the line ruling size um, for the Polar Vision was five to six um, microns. Um, for the polar chrome, which is over there on the right-hand side, um, it was about 50% larger, and the line rulings of polar chrome were about eight to nine um, microns, which, interestingly enough, is the same diameter as a red blood cell. You didn't know that, did you? And um, cells uh, in the human body vary between 100 and um 10 microns. Uh, my pinhole that I have in my pinhole camera that I talked about in another talk um, is, is there for size comparison, about a third of a millimetre. Um, and I have um, shown some sort of my estimates of what you would, what it would take to get a clump or a group of these lines, grid, uh, um, on the autochrome. And um, that's my estimate of a pixel size, which um, I've also tried to compare to digital sensors. So um, looking up um, the size of digital sensors, it says that a full frame 35 millimeter sensor is about 10 microns per pixel, which is why I've sort of tried to make the other comparisons per pixel. Um, an iPhone sensor is about one tenth of that. It's about one micron apparently. So. There's there's some there's some interesting size comparisons for you. 
Um, and you're going to have to indulge me for a, a couple of minutes now um, while I talk about uh, my favourite additive colour um, process, which is autochrome. And um, who knew the potato was so versatile um, and that you could make colour photographs with it? So um, the Lumio brothers, as you all know, beginning of the 1900s developed um you know a, an amazing color process which um was was one of the, the most successful um beginning of the the 1900s um and they dyed starch grains and they made some amazing pictures and um i went to monet's gardens in earlier this year um, and this is one of the photographs from the book uh, that I, I have on one edge. And um, this was apparently taken in about 1921 uh, with um, autochrome. And I, I just think that the quality is, is absolutely amazing. And if you put um, an enlargement in there, it, it just amazingly suits impressionist art i think so i just i just love it anyway my indulgence over and back to um polychrome so this is my attempt at um looking at the the film um with reflected light and transmitted light so um if you you know they're they're just come out as conventional films um, you pull it out the cassette, you get something which feels um, very flimsy in comparison to regular film. Um, and obviously, um, like autochrome, um, as an additive colour process, it is very dense. So autochrome and polychrome um, transmits of the order of 8% of the instant light. Um, and that's, you know, one, as you know, one of the main um, issues with additive colour photographic processes. Um, much better with, um, you know, our digital devices because they're emitting light at us. They're not trying to take it through transmitted light. So um, the films that I bought, I bought them in a camera fair. Um, it might, it probably was um, Photographica. Um, in um, around um, 2012, um, they were um, from 1998, um, best before 1998. So they were only about 15 years um, past their best before date when I processed them. And the main issue that you get with, with processing the old stuff is that the, the black um, backing that is supposed to peel away with the, 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 the leader that goes along the film and, and winds back into the cassette um, doesn't, doesn't come off. So you end up with this film that's got all this black stuff on it. So you need to wipe that off. So you can see from most noticeably on the, 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 the black and white ones, you can see that um, around all the sprocket holes where I haven't wiped it off and ingressing into the, the frame area that uh, it's not come off completely. But it did work. Um, I got photographs, as you can see, um, all those years later. And here are some um, images from um, Camden Lock on the Polar Chrome. Um, the, uh, I've, I've actually seen since online um, people just washing this black stuff off under the tap. So I just wish I'd seen that before I managed to, um, you know, not very successfully um, try to get it off with some some cotton wool and and damage some of the frames as you can see there um so i don't know whether that takes or probably takes off some of the stabilizer by washing off the the film i don't know um but some some good shots and some nice um 
you know, atmospheric scratch shots, you could say. <clears throat> and here are the polograph um, of that amazing Art Deco building in, in Bex Hill, which sort of suits suits a bit of a you know treatment that that makes it look a bit weird that was um what i was was after there and that is basically the end of my talk um i've got um two books um on dr edwin land's um life and um developments if you um, read anything up about this guy, um, I think you know you'll agree that he's um, uh, really interesting, and you know some of the stuff that that came out of the Polaroid stable is amazing. Um, my favourite camera, the SX70, um, he's holding there, which you know the development of that is a is a complete another story. And um, thank you for listening.